Good morning, how are we doing today? This is James Sweeney, aka Split Suit. Welcome back to another video. And this is going to be part seven of 10 of the prefop strategy and range quiz. As always, we're gonna do some hand reading, do some line analysis, and talk about how you can play better preflop poker. So if you've already taken this quiz, awesome, hold on tight. If you haven't, maybe pause here, I'll leave a link in the description box, take it, and I'll meet you back here to do questions 14 and 15. All right, so the spot we're gonna look at is this. Playing live 2-5, a lag open raises to 20 bucks from EP2. There are two callers, both of them are unknowns, and the tag in the small blind squeezes to a buck 40 total. So what range in percentage form do you think the tag is making this squeeze with? If we take all of the responses we got, which was over 2,000, and graph everything from a 0% range up to a 100% range, we see this with a median answer of a 7% range and an average answer of 11.4%. And we notice that there's a fair amount of confidence here that the answer is going to be somewhere between 0 and 20%, but by the same token, there's a lot of people that are kind of in here at like 5-ish percent, and then some people that are really between like 10 and 15. So let's take a moment, graph this out in flops and see what this actually looks like. So let's start by working with the average answer of roughly an 11% range of hands and plug that in. And like we mentioned in one of the earlier videos in this series, one of the things that can kind of create some problems or at least some confusion is when you're going through a range of hands and you're trying to build a three bet range or a squeeze range or any sort of really re-raising range prefop, there's a couple of different ways you can build it. Okay, so this way is called depolarized. Pretty much means everything is up in that top left-hand corner. Just so happens to be an arrow this time. That's kind of the way that I remember it. Depolarized, everything is kind of sitting up here, right in that value or some value kind of spectrum. Now, there is another way you can build this, and that's called polarized. So polarized would be, okay, we have strong hands in there, sure, but then the rest of the hands are comprised of things that are not so strong, right? So we have the poles of things. We have strong stuff and not strong stuff. And maybe it's stuff like this, maybe it's built with this, but either way, you end up getting some strong hands, and then some percentage of that range is going to be made up of other nonsense. So again, polarized, depolarized. Now the thing is, is when you're building this range, it can be a little bit tricky to say, is the tag more likely to be polarized or depolarized in this situation? But it is important to understand where kind of the bottom of the value is and okay, how much of the rest of the range is built up of other stuff, be it pulled stuff or depolled stuff. So here's my major, major issue in this situation. We have a tag, 200 big blinds effective, squeezing from the small blind, and two of those players are unknown, and we have roughly 200 big blinds stack depth with the tag against pretty much everyone left in this hand. So I don't think the tag is going to be nearly as wide as the average person thought here, right? The average person thought this was going to be about 11.4% of hands. I think that is a very, very wide range, right? If we wanted to get that to that, you know, throw that in there, we're at 11. To right now. So the issue here is I don't think that a tag is going to be squeezing sevens here as a default, ace 10 offsuit as a default, even king queen suited always as a default, right? A live tag is typically going to be calling quite a few of the hands that I think people would default put into a depolarized squeezing range here. So if I'm building this range, I'm going to do a couple things. One, I always start with the really strong stuff. And I think in this situation, queens plus ace king, automatic slam dunk squeeze, no real questions. And I think the average tag is going to be doing that. Yes. But first and foremost, how wide are we going to go here, right? Are we going to take this up to a 5% range of hands? Are we going to take this up to 7, 10, 15, 38? And personally, I actually think the median answer was probably pretty close. I think a 7% squeezing range here is actually pretty much in the ballpark. So I'm going to use the median here and kind of go from there. And you notice, one, this is much, much tighter than what the average person thought in the spot. And the way that we build it, I'm going to give you one key question that I ask myself in this spot. I really ask myself two things about the small blind or about the tag or about any squeezer in this situation. Would they squeeze with things like jacks, tens, and nines? And would they squeeze with like ace, queen, king, queen, ace, jack suited kind of hands? If you can answer that question, even if it's not perfect, but at least you get in the habit of asking yourself that question, it will really help you understand where the cusp of their value stuff is. Because if they will squeeze, say, tens plus, ace, queen plus, and king, queen suited for whatever reason here, you notice that that gets us to 5% of hands. 
okay, well, if we think that they're squeezing 7%, then clearly there's, you know, 2 over 7 if that's their their air stuff. And again, that could be 9s, that could be ace 2 suited, depends on how they build it. But ultimately, there's going to be some nonsense in there. And there are some hands in here, like ace-queen, which, okay, that's important for us to know. Are they going to be squeezing that, or are they more likely to flat it? In my experience, live tags are typically not super thrilled to squeeze with hands like that. So personally, I think they probably squeeze jacks plus. I think they probably squeeze ace-king. But I don't think ace-queen is an auto. I definitely don't think king-queen is an auto. And I don't think pocket tens is an auto. So we got a couple different options here. And I know this is getting a little bit lengthy in this hand reading part. But I think this is important to, to again, understand the process. One thing I might do is I might say, okay, I'm going to put in a little bit of weight. You know, some percentage of the time they're going to squeeze tens. Some percentage ace-queen ace queen suited and let's say king queen offsuit let's say they're more likely to flat king queen suited because it plays a little bit better multi-way fine so this is the range that i might assign here for the value stuff but you notice that this is only roughly half of the seven percent total range so i don't know exactly what else they're squeezing here it's very difficult to discern if it's going to include things like ace 10 suited or more likely to include like ace deuce to ace five or suited gappers that he doesn't really want to fly with or suited double gappers that he doesn't want to fly with or like king seven suited and use some of the blocker value from that kind of hand it's difficult to say, but this is probably where I'm going to start with, a range that's about half-ish value, that's about half-ish other stuff, and probably caps out around jacks plus ace king with some of the other stuff in there just to make sure that it's rounded and balanced out a little bit. So that's what I would assign in this situation, and again, you notice how different that is from roughly an 11% range of hands getting squeezed here. I just don't think a tag, an average live tag out of the small blind with depth is going to be that that wide. That's my personal opinion. I think a lot of numbers would back that up. If you guys disagree, I'm more than open to have a conversation about it. But personally, I think this is probably what you're looking at. Somewhere between 5 to 7% squeezing range, not quite getting over 10% from the average tag, in my opinion. Now, putting the tag on a correct squeezing range is very important, but it's only half the battle since there is a second part of this question. So if we look down at Pocket Kings next to Act, what is our play in this situation? So looking at your guys' answers, roughly 60% of y'all said you would 4-bet, 30% said you would shove, 9% said call, and 16 people said they would fold. So I'm never folding in this situation. If you think the tag is only, only, only squeezing kings plus, sure, we can have a conversation about that. But I don't think you could ever say the tag wouldn't squeeze here with ace-king. And as soon as you can add at least ace-king into this range, I think folding is egregiously irresponsible. So it's really between four-betting and calling. And clearly, based upon those numbers, most of y'all want a four-bet. Some want to shove. And clearly, we have other four-bet numbers that are included in there. We could go up to something like 300 we could go to something like four or 500 or we could shove and, and when it comes to the overall four betting camp a lot of y'all kind of like the shove option which i thought was kind of interesting Personally, if I look at calling as an option here, and I always like to look at all of my options and kind of gauge their viability, I don't really think there's too many hands I would call with here, right? A lot of people, if they're going to cold call a three bet or cold call a squeeze like this, it's going to be with an extremely predictable range of hands, right? Probably jacks, queens, maybe aces and kings to, to mix it up, and maybe occasionally something like pocket tens or ace king suited, and that's pretty much about it. So it's very, very predictable. And I don't really see that being the best way to maximize in this situation. So because of that, I might just say, you know what? I'm not really going to have any call range here. I'm just going to shove everything into my four bet if I'm going to continue with it or fold if I'm not going to continue with it. And clearly there's going to be a lot of default folding here because you are in the big blind. You have a random hand. Sure, this time we have pocket kings, but more often than not, we're not going to have all that much. So this is kind of a weird situation, but it's definitely worth exploring nonetheless. Now, if we're looking at 4-betting between kind of two options, either 4-bet to a quote-unquote normal number or 4-bet as a shove, I think shoving is risking a significant amount of money, and I don't think it's very likely that I would have much of a shoving range in this situation, just based upon the fact that I'm cold 4-betting 200 bigs in the middle, and I don't really think that's probably going to be the best overall play. I don't think it's going to maximize my, my overall winnings here. The major thing that I'm thinking about here is remember the range of hands that we built for the small blind, right? So here's the first 
first issue that people tend to have. They do a little bit of hand reading, then look down at a monster hand, and then they just abandon the hand reading altogether. And if you're one of those people, I would just suggest slowing down, focus on the range of hands you assigned, and how you can maximize value against that range. Right, so if we're in here and we think that this is the range of hands, if we shove, is he really gonna call with jacks? Is he really gonna call with pocket tens when he has them, or ace queen when he has that, or even king queen, right? I think all of a sudden they're folding a tremendous amount of hands, which could mean that you say, okay, well, I think it's actually very valuable for me to bluff shove a tremendous amount of the time here, and then I should have some kings in my four bending range that I'm shoving with, so that way I can have some value in there as well the times that he does call. You could make that argument and you could certainly try to craft that strategy. I think it's a situation that doesn't come up all that often and I don't think it's quite worth the time to do ultra crafting. What I do think is worthwhile is to understand a four bending range overall and make sure that if you are gonna four bet for a non-shove that you size it appropriately. So again, you could shove. You could definitely come up with instances and scenarios where shoving makes a lot of sense and even more so if the tag is squeezing a very, very polarized range here and there's more hands in that range that can and will consider calling the shove thinking that you're just mucking around or maybe they think you're doing this with these king a lot so maybe they start calling you with all the pocket pairs again you can come up with scenarios and assumption sets where that makes sense but i think overall that's probably not going to be the case and as you think this range gets more and more polarized and you remove hands like nines eights sevens ace jack from the overall squeezing range then clearly those hands aren't involved in here where they could call your your shove that lightly and again i, I just think at that point you're generating a lot of folds which is great but I don't think you're maximizing your EV overall. So I think four bending to a more normal size will generate more possibility for the tag to make mistakes, either looking at the pot odds and say, well, I have to give action here because I'm getting a great price, especially if you four bet to around like 320-ish, maybe 300 flat. I really don't want to go so large that I really make it look like I never have bluffs and I let the tag play too close to perfect. But if you leave a little bit of shoving room, maybe the tag thinks that they can come over the top with, you know, ace deuce suited or whatever, that could be really, really good. So I like four betting normally. I like four betting for pretty much as small as we can get away with. So again, probably 300, 295 would be my actual number in real time. And then we'll just make some decisions and go from there. And at that point, it's, I mean, the pot's huge. There's really not many decisions to make pre-flop or post-flop certainly never going to come over the top and then fold to a shove so really it's just if he calls how am i going to play the nothing sbr pot and as a default get it in feel very very comfortable so again, I like that y'all are on the right track in terms of thinking about four betting. I just think that four betting to a normal size is going to be better than just four bet shoving. I think shoving has a little bit more fear based in it. And unless there's some very serious reads or information, I just think four betting regularly is going to do more for you in the long run. Now, one thing I really want to leave you with here, whether you're looking at this spot as is with pocket kings, or maybe you have ace king, or maybe you have pocket tens, or maybe you have ace four suited, is that spots like these are extremely mathematical, right? It, all, everything we're talking about, we're looking at the small binds range, we're looking at how often they're going to fold, we're looking at the math behind our four betting, whether we four bet normal or four bet shove, and how that's going to impact the tag. All of these things are extremely mathematical. And whenever you're talking about prefop committing, where that risk reward is really a play, it's very very important that you have these spots down. So I'd love to invite you to read my guide called Four Math Concepts All Poker Players Need to Know. If you are struggling with poker math, you're not 100% sure, or you don't feel super confident with it, start here. Everything we talked about in this video is pretty much going to be relevant right there in that article. It will help you understand all of these concepts because once you have them down, line creation becomes infinitely easier. So again, link in the description box, check it out. Even if you really, really hate math, start here and see if it makes a little bit more sense once you give it a full read. And that is going to wrap it up for this video. Hopefully you enjoyed, hopefully you learned a little bit, and as always, if you have any comments or questions, please don't hesitate to let me know. If you wouldn't mind liking the video, I'd really appreciate it. Make sure to subscribe and hit that little bell notification. That way you get a heads up every single time a new video is released. Be on the lookout for parts 8, 9, and 10 coming out shortly, and again, if you need anything, just let me know. Otherwise, as always, good luck out there, and happy grinding.